Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, session event, first time, not in Pilsen, but first time in our faculty uh, forum 2000. And uh, we are happy uh, to welcome uh, guests. But before I introduce you our guests, which will discuss the topic media and democracy, let me introduce you, director of Forum 2000, Magister Tomáš Freuda, uh, of not Forum 2000, but uh, director of uh, Pilsen 2015. Uh, so I'd like you to have first words to this session. Dobrý den, jsem rád, že vás mohu pozdravit tedy ještě jednou, aby stíhal pan tlumočník. Mně letošní téma Fóra 2000 připadá velmi trefné a místné, nebo na místě, i vzhledem k výsledku nedávných voleb. Já sám si kladu otázku, do jaké míry je ta takzvaná špatná nálada a jakási, jakési znechucení politikou jenom vinou politiků a politické scény a nekultivovanosti, anebo také působení médií, protože, jak známo, média jsou tady především pro toho, aby se prodávala a prodávají se nejlépe negativní a špatné zprávy a ti z vás, kteří někdy něco organizovali a museli to umístovat do médií a chtěli, aby se o tom psalo, po případě se účastnili věcí a pak si přečetli, jak se o tom píše v médiích, nebo informuje v médiích. Často jsou to dva úplně opačné obrázky, dvě různé reality. Tudíž pro mě velmi téma aktuální. Já vám přeji velmi podnětné a inspirující, inspirující konferenci a budu se s vámi těšit na dalších akcích, ať už našich Plzně 215 na viděnou a samozřejmě v tom kýženém roce, kdy budeme nést hrdě titul. Děkuji. Děkuji panu magistrovi za jeho slovo. No a jako v tuto chvíli bych přivítal také pana děkana Fakulty filozofické Západočeské univerzity v Plzni, pana docenta Pavla Vařeku a dal bych mu tedy pár slov. Děkuji. Jednacím jazykem tohoto panelu bude angličtina, tak já už přejdu do tohoto jazyka. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to welcome participants of Forum 2000 in uh, the Faculty of Philosophy and Arts, University of West Bohemia in Plzeň. Our faculty uh, cooperates uh, together with Pilsen 2015, European Capital of Culture, in organizing uh, today's panel. Uh, this panel that is uh, uh, it's concerning uh, media, culture and civic society uh, development. Uh, I believe uh, uh, we're going to have a very interesting and fruitful discussion here. I also wish uh, our dear participants uh, to have a nice day in our faculty and in the city of Plzeň. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I also try to switch to English uh, from now. Uh, okay, so uh, our uh, topic of our discussion is framed by a general topic of Forum 2000, Media and Democracy. And in the framework of Media and Democracy, uh, today, di today's discussion would be focused on media and culture and development of civic society. Uh, which uh, is a topic quite wide, but uh, actually before uh, saying a few words about uh, contemporary uh, discussion and uh, before introducing you panelists, I'd like to tell you that uh, we have to finish in uh, uh, let's about uh, hour and a half. Uh, and uh, first, each of panelists would have like five to seven minutes of speech and afterwards we would circle and discuss the topic, uh, general topic, or we would of course go into details. And afterwards, don't worry, you would uh, get uh, questions, uh, you would get uh, your space to ask questions and discuss with uh, anybody from the panel you wish to talk with. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, allow me to introduce panelists uh, from my left, uh, uh, from your right and my left is, the, but don't think it politically, 
is uh, Mikola Ryabchuk, political scientist. <laughs> political scientist and cultural analyst from Kiev. And on my right, uh, Shlomo Avineri, professor of political science in Hebrew University uh, in Israel. And from my right, Jaroslav Valuch uh, from Člověk v tísni, uh, expert on new media. Okay, so as I already noticed, uh, media and uh, democracy is uh, quite a wide uh, topic and uh, culture and uh, civic society within the culture has been quite frequented in the uh, last uh, three decades. Although uh, civic society uh, in uh, Western political thought has been framed by Aristotle through Hegel, Tocqueville, and uh, in 20th century by Habermas, uh, which is very much understood as a public sphere. But how this uh, civic society uh, is interconnected with uh, globalization and with the media, uh, that would be a topic of contemporary discussion. So first of all, I would give uh, the word uh, to, Jaros uh, to uh, Miroslav, uh, Mikola Ryabčuk, I'm sorry. Dobrý den a děkuji za, za pozvání, za možnost tady stretnutí. I believe that I have to speak English. Uh, well, um, we have a general topic uh, of democracy and uh, media, uh, and there is obvious thing that uh, there could not be democracy without free media and no free media without democracy. So it looks like a chicken and egg dilemma. Uh, but in this case, I believe that uh, egg is more important uh, than chicken. Uh, I mean that uh, if, if you have free media, you can, you can construct democracy, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's primary value. It's very important to, de to, de to defend. And I feel this uh, importance of media uh, in particular uh, in my own country, which still is... Uh, uh, as we say all the time, at crossroads. We still cannot make final choice and to move either towards uh, consolidated democracy or towards uh, uh, consolidated authoritarianism. We, Ukraine still fluctuates between these two options. And uh, media play extremely important role because this is the most important element of civil society, the most important element of uh, civic control over, over the government. Uh, uh, all the countries which uh, came uh, from communism, they uh, inherited very weak uh, judiciary, actually non-existent independent judiciary, non-existent um, uh, um, uh, uh, legislature. Uh, executive uh, executive uh, power was uh, omnipotent, was dominant. Uh, actually, it was the only power uh, under communism. And we still have this uh, bad, uh, this, uh, bad legacy uh, because still we have uh, executive, uh, much uh, stronger, executive branch of, uh, of government, much stronger than all other branches, in, uh, including leg legislature and, and judiciary. So in this situation, uh, mass media are extremely important because they really can, uh, can um, in a way, they can substitute for the lack of, of strong judiciary or independent uh, legislature. Uh, they can uh, impose some, uh, some checks and balances or substitute of check, checks and balances. So it's, it's really a really important thing. And also, um, uh, mass media uh, in, in countries like Ukraine uh, play also important role of civic education. Um, uh, I believe it's also important because we cannot substantially improve the quality, quality of ruling elite without improving, improving quality of, of the society in general. Uh, we may complain a lot about uh, government, about people who rule us, but basically they are the same people uh, as, as we are. They are people from 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 the people yeah uh, they they uh, did not uh, come from you know mars or from washington or from moscow they are local people people like us and they uh, bear all the same features the same uh, strong and weak features uh, it's uh, it's very very 
uh, very similar. Um, I imagine, you know, this um, uh, connection between a ruling elite and uh, 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 and the population as a connection between uh, between two vessels. And uh, since you have uh, secondary education, you know this law of uh, connected vessels. You know that uh, the level of water in small vessel uh, is would be the same as in a uh, big, uh, as in a large vessel, as long as these vessels are connected. Uh, so it's very important to keep them, con them connected, because if this connection is uh, distorted and broken, uh, we would have the situation which uh, typically occurs in authoritarian states when this connection is broken. Uh, we have a level in small vessel, which, is, which stands for ruling elite, a level of water which dramatically declines. Uh, by water, I mean here uh, political culture or broadly understood culture. Um, and, uh, and, you know, if you have this uh, um, level of water different in these two, two vessels, obviously, sooner or later, uh, it should, uh, the, pressure, uh, the pressure increases and the pressure uh, breaks the dam. Uh, actually, what happened in Ukraine during the Orange Revolution, when uh, the previous government uh, broke this connection between small vessel and, and uh, large vessel. So the, the, pressure, um, the pressure increased so dramatically that sooner or later it had, had to be broken. Actually, it happened also in all these uh, communist or uh, post-communist countries. Um, so uh, it's also very, very important to, uh, to, uh, to maintain uh, this connection and maintain the level of political culture uh, appropriate. Um, and um, I, I don't want to, to exaggerate uh, the path dependence theory, the, the dependence on uh, civilizational belonging. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, Samuel Huntington, but still uh, we cannot avoid this problem. On the one hand, we know that institutions are important, but on the other hand, we know that uh, the same institutions may work differently in different environments. Uh, so uh, culture is also very important. Political culture is important. And if you take a look at all the post-communist states, and there are about 30 of them, uh, you would see very clear uh, dividing line, which states uh, proved to be the most successful and which proved uh, the least successful. There is very clear, uh, there are uh, three very clear groups there. The most successful states belong to the realm of Western Christianity. Whether we like it or not, but all of them are either uh, Catholic or Protestant. Well, actually, there are two, only two Protestant countries, uh, Latvia and Estonia. But uh, all, the, all of them belong to Western realm. Uh, the least successful countries are from Central Asia. All of them are Muslim states. They belong to this uh, civilizational realm. And uh, the countries in the middle, they uh, belong to Eastern uh, Christian realm, to uh, legacy of Byzantium. Uh, either in the western part of the former Soviet Union or in the Balkans. It's a very, very clear dividing uh, line. Of course, it's not determined only by uh, civilization and belonging, not only by religion, but, but also probably by, by belonging to um, different empires. Because all the, the most successful post-communist states belong to western empires, either to uh, Germany or to Austria, to, to Habsburgs. Uh, the least successful belong either to Ottomans or to Russian Empire, to countries which never had any uh, rule of law, any idea of rule of law, uh, uh, not, not, not to mention democracy, but rule of law is probably most important. And of course, no idea of uh, contractual relations between uh, rulers and, and subjects, no idea of any freedom and uh, sovereignty of a person and so on. Uh, so um, I feel that we have this, this very com complicated um, interconnection of different factors, but still I, I'd like to emphasize that uh, the uh, media are in the center of this, uh, of, of this uh, constellation of, of factors. And uh, uh, as long as uh, we have uh, free uh, and more or less independent media in the country, it's, the story is not over. And this is what gives me uh, some sort of optimism in Ukraine because uh, we have very different governments, sometimes very bad governments, but uh, the media are uh, alive and well, or more or less well, and this gives some chance for the better future.
Thank you. So, uh, Professor Shlovo Avineri, uh, your turn. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank uh, for the invitation to come to Pilsen. This is my first uh, visit here. I do have some Czech land background. My, one of my grandfathers was born in Trebich, so this is not exactly a foreign country to me, but I, the first time I'm here in Pilsen, and thank you very much for the opportunity. I'd like to follow um, the previous statement, and coming from the Middle East, where we had some very dramatic development in the last two years, trying to bring a wider context, which can perhaps be a little bit comparative. Uh, when you look at uh, what is happening in Central and Eastern Europe in the last 20 years, there is something which is today uh, understandable and taken for granted, but was not really viewed as such around 1990, where most of you were, I think, born or something like that. So it's not your personal memory, but I guess there is some institutional or historical memory you know. When the Soviet empire collapsed, and when all communist regimes in Central Eastern Europe collapsed, uh, there was a feeling that now the door is open for a liberal, democratic, market, capitalist development. Uh, some people, like Francis Fukuyama, or even spoke about the end of history. And uh, when you looked at that time, around 1990, at what was happening in this area, you could see that, yes, all those countries have similar, uh, have had a similar starting point. I mean, obviously, there were differences. But all communist countries had a number of things in common. There was a monopoly of power in the hand of a state party, one party. There was a political centralized state control of the economy. There was state and party control of education and the media. So there was an ideological centralization. And the idea was that absent communist dictatorship, all those countries will develop, some of them slower, some of them quicker, to democracy. Today, 20 years later, we find that there are enormous differences, and some of the differences were already mentioned. Uh, there are countries uh, which developed uh, towards a, a consolidated democracy, and democracy is not a situation without problems. Democracy is not utopia. Democracy is not uh, a paradise. Democracy is a structure of how to deal with differences peacefully. But you have countries like Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, which has no specific problems, uh, which were basically successful in developing towards democracy and a uh, market economy. And then you have countries like Russia and uh, Ukraine, very different, uh, where the situation is problematic. In some countries, more problematic than others. And when you ask yourself as a political and social scientist, what is the uh, explanation for these differences? Because 20 years ago, those countries try, uh, it started more or less with the, same, uh, with the same starting point. I mean, they were obviously different between the Soviet Union and the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia at that time in Poland, especially when it comes to the issue of small businesses or the church, but basically they had some common denominator. And when you look at socioeconomic indicators, uh, quantitative indicators in terms of uh, uh, de industrial development, uh, urbanization, etc. This doesn't give you an answer for these great differences. And the answer has to do with something which is the core of our discussion, and this is civil society. In societies or countries like Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovakia, uh, some of the Baltic countries, there was a tradition of civil society. In the case of the Czechoslovak Republic, not only civil society, but a tradition of a consolidated democracy before 1938. Uh, in Poland and Hungary, uh, democracy was more problematic, but there were traditions of civil society, traditions of representation, which were perhaps in more many countries uh, noble aristocratic representation, but the idea that there was representation. A role of the church, very different, but it wasn't just a state church as in Russia. Uh, you had the autonomy of universities. You had uh, city burger autonomies. Uh, you had uh, trade unions, and you had a memory of political parties. After 1990, in some cases, also in Prague, there were still old social democrats and old liberals who came back. Uh, they were really very old and not very active, but there was an institutional memory. 
people in Poland or in the, in the Czech Republic could speak about representative assemblies going back hundreds of years. Again, not democratic, aristocratic, but representative. Therefore, transition was easier. In a country like Russia, where there is very little of a tradition of civil society, if there is a tradition of modernization, and there are traditions of modernization in Russia, but they are identified with a very autocratic ruler, like, like Peter the Great. I don't know what the Great, Peter. Uh, Tsar Peter, who was a modernizer, but an autocratic modernizer. So you have modernization that goes with autocracy. Very short, if you want to understand developments now, look, among other things, to historical, histor historical, to historical uh, developments. Not that history determines everything, but history is a starting point. You can overcome history, you can be counter-historian, but you start with the building blocks of what historical traditions and institutions and the memories of these institutions in people's mind to give you. And now I want to say something about uh, the Middle East, which has to do with this. Uh, I think um, also for all of us who saw a year and a half ago, two years ago, those young uh, people in Tahrir Square in, uh, in, uh, in Cairo, who looked very much like you, dressed very much like you, spoke the lingua franca uh, of the uh, Western liberal uh, academics, which is English, uh, dressed in jeans, uh, had uh, uh, their mobiles, had uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts, and everybody thought, ah, this is a new Egypt. After the dictator goes, this is a new Egypt. And then you had elections in Egypt, and 75% of the population voted either for the Muslim Brotherhood or for the more fundamentalist Salafis. And people asked yourself, where were the nice guys and girls from Tahrir Square? They were there, but they were 5% of the population. But they were the ones we saw on TV, and therefore media sometimes creates a problem. Because for most Egyptians, there are 75 million people in Egypt. 75 million people in Egypt. Most of them not only do not have Twitter accounts or mobiles, most of them do not have electricity and clean water in their homes. And then when they voted, they didn't vote like the nice guys and girls on Tahrir Square. They voted for somebody who uh, promised them authenticity, history, uh, and also bread and water, because the Muslim Brotherhood is also a social network. It's not just a religious organization. So when you look at the developments in, in, in Central Eastern Europe, you can learn something from it regarding the Middle Eastern development. You have to ask yourself, is, is there a strong civil society in Egypt? Is there a strong civil society in, uh, in Tunis? Is there a strong civil society in Syria where things are still very open? The answer is yes, but it's problematic. The strongest element in civil society in Egypt was the Muslim Brotherhood. It was civil society. It had its uh, network, it had not its newspapers, but it had its schools, it had its clinics, it had its support groups for women, children, alcoholics, prostitutes, uh, drug uh, addicts. It, they did something very important which the government failed to do, and therefore when people had the choice of voting, many of them voted for them. So when you want to look it's the future of a country or a society or a region. One of the things we should look, and I'm saying it as a social scientist, don't look at numerical tables and GNP per capita only. Look also at historical developments. Look at what are the historical legacies which people work within because this is in their mind, in their consciousness, in their behavior. And therefore, you will find that the answer to the future to a very large extent depends on civil society, on the autonomy of institutions of civil society, from universities, from churches, and also from the media. So I wanted to bring this uh, comparative element also into our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, <clears throat> and now I ask uh, Jaroslav Valuch for uh, his first opening five to seven minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, uh, in 2003, after my graduation, when I decided not to join the military at that time, so I joined the People in Need organization. Probably most of you are aware of what People in Need is doing. It's a humanitarian and a human rights organization. 
and uh, I was trying to I was trying to use what I learned at school, which was marketing and advertising, which I actually decided that I never want to do. So I was trying to use these methodologies, like in the work that I was that I was doing for people in need, and I ended up in a project which was focused on education on on, on high schools primarily and the, and the, and the primary schools as well. And what we learned after a couple of years of really using you know different types of audiovisual material in the schools. We decided that there is an increasing need for something that is called the media literacy or the media education. In the in the age when you know most of the communication is is mediated through media, I mean we need more than ever uh, kind of the ability, the skills, and understanding of how media works to be able to really kind of deconstruct the messages that are you know bombarding us uh, on a on a on a daily basis from the mass media in the streets, from billboards, through advertising, etc. And well, it was kind of a challenge, right? Because how you want to address the majority of students and teach them media literacy when you have majority of teachers who are completely media illiterate as well, right? So we're struggling with this. We tried to produce uh, audiovisual sets, you know, that went to the school so that the teachers can use it and and young people can become more uh, critical about the influence of media and can gain some more critical skills so that they're not going to be that easily manipulated through uh, any type of messages and. When we were distributing this to schools in 2008, I already knew that that we are way, you know, we are living in a completely different media world than the young people are, right? Because we were kind of trying to teach them how the, how press works, how radio works, how the television works, you know, what is the uh, what are the rules of traditional journalism? And at that time, the young people were already living in a different age, in a digital age, right? They were getting information from social networks, from their friends, from the internet. And it was also the time of these first uh, Twitter revolutions, right? It was Mo Moldova and Iran, 2008, 2009, when the media were calling these revolutions, or at least attempts for revolutions, Twitter revolutions. So for me, it was like, wow, that's cool, that's interesting, and I really wanted to learn more, like what is what is what is going on. So so I created my Facebook account, and I went to US to study uh, to study these kind of new trends in digital media and new media. And I was because I, I always consider myself as an activist. I was, uh, you know, active in my community since uh, since I was uh, since I was young. So I consider myself as an activist. So I was really uh, trying to understand how can we use this new environment and these new tools. How can we use them to mobilize public, uh, to increase the participation of people in the in the public life, in the political life, etc. And uh, in the U.S., I had the opportunity to start working on some projects, particularly uh, working on. Uh, improving the communication with disaster and crisis affected communities through social media and mobile communication, right? Like linking the people affected uh, by conflict with people who can provide assistance. And it's a whole new exciting field and I'm still, ex uh, still exploring. But what we are really witnessing is this kind of shift from this traditional mass media age when the, the, the communication could be characteri uh, characterized as the top down one way communication to something that is more bottom-up and many-to-many -many communication, right? And the key word here is the access. It's access to technology and access to the, to the technical means that enable you to produce and distribute messages, right? In the age of traditional media, it was simply difficult. I mean, not, not many of us could afford to run our own television station or run our, uh, our own radio station, right? And, uh, and that also influenced like how we are consuming messages. We, are in the, we were primarily in the role of consumers because the interaction with the media was almost impossible. Right? Okay, you could send a letter to the editor in the newspaper hoping that they will publish, publish your response, but still, I mean, that's, that's, I wouldn't call this interactivity. And with social media, we are really witnessing some major shift because, I mean, today anybody with access uh, with access to internet, access to network, and with some basic technologies such as mobile phone, can actually become producer of, of content and also can become distributor of content, right? And and for me, the interesting part here is, okay, so what is actually the, the role of traditional media to these days? What is the role of active people in the society these days who are empowered by the technology to, to communicate their messages more efficiently with people? And... Uh, and uh, there is this traditional notion that the, that the mass media were the were the gatekeepers, right? Or the, or the traditional journalism was the was the uh, journalists were the gatekeepers, the ones who have access to information and they decide what information we will consume, what information we will see in the in the evening news. And it's completely changing. Today, most of the breaking news are not coming from the journalists, but it's coming from the citizens who are reporting it from their mobile phones, on Twitter. Uh, on Facebook and other social networks. So the role of traditional journalism is, is shifting. And I would say that it's shifting from this kind of gatekeeper's role into role of curation. Uh, 
because we need the traditional journal, uh, qu good quality journalism and media and, and uh, a good quality media to help us to understand what's going on. And I remember on the January 25th when the first mass demonstration started on the Tahrir Square in Egypt. I mean, it was a really exciting moment because immediately I could start following on Twitter what is happening there, right? I was watching the videos from the streets, I was watching the pictures, reading news directly from the people, uh, from the people on the ground. And it was exciting because it took another three days for Al Jazeera to start reporting what is happening. It took another six days for BBC and CNN to report. It took another almost three weeks for Czech media to start reporting what is actually happening. And I realized that despite the fact that it's so exciting to be almost witnessing in real time on Twitter, I didn't have really understanding what's going on, right? Because I was not that much kind of uh, uh, experienced or educated in, you know, Egyptian history, politics, social, cultural aspects of, 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 that, of that culture, of that country. And I realized that I still need the co good quality journalism to help me to put this information into context, right? You can watch thousands of videos of people being beaten on the street, but you still really don't know, like, what is, what is going on. And you don't know what's going to happen in the, in the future. I mean, the dynamics of the events. And that's probably why it was called the Facebook revolution. Uh, regardless what we think about it, was that the social media definitely gave um, unprecedented dynamics to the events. How quickly the information was spreading through the region, how quickly we were able to learn what is going on. But at the same time, uh, we really don't know where this is going on. And for me, the eye-opening experience was one year, uh, one year ago when uh, I was doing a training uh, for Egyptian journalists in Prague who, who were brought to Czech Republic to learn something from our transition experience. And I said, like, yeah, sure, of course I can do a training on social media. But I was freaking out because, I mean, it's easy to do a training on social media somewhere in Georgia or in Burma, right, where people kind of don't know much about it, so you can be the expert there. But I was like, what I'm going to teach these journalists who were actually the active uh, the active participants of the Facebook revolution, right? So, so I was really worried, and and uh, it was really eye-opening moment because, you know, those people who were sitting in the room, they were not the journalists as we as we as we um, think about it, or you know, the notion of journalists that we have. Those were young people, activists who just became kind of journalists and citizen journalists simply because they had access to technology and they started sharing information uh, du during what was happening, and despite the fact that. Each one of them had 10 times more followers than I have on Twitter, for example. They were tweeting directly from my session on the workshop, right, like live. So despite the fact that they actually have a good handle and good grasp of these new tools of using them, I just realized that they have no idea how to use these tools in a more strategic way to really achieve something, to achieve their goals, to, to plan what they want to do. And I was in Cairo three weeks ago working with another group of, of, of young people of, uh, f from citizen initiatives. And I can really, I think I can really see why the situation in Egypt is turning the way it is. And, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Avinari mentioned that. That I mean, the, the young liberals are trying, are, are feeling being betrayed, right? That somebody stole their revolution. I mean, they, they were the ones, or they feel like they were the ones who, who made the Mubarak step down. But you can see people are back on the streets, and we really don't know where the situation uh, in Egypt is is turning into. And this is probably also the limit of the social media and of these young activists who are able to use these tools to communicate. But once they are, when, once they have to face the traditional power structures such as the military or power and strong structures such as the Muslim Brotherhood has uh, in, the, in the society. I mean, they cannot win, or, or at least they are not winning this time. Because simply, uh, unless they understand how important is this kind of traditional community activism, that means working on the very local level, this kind of slow activism, not that quick one that you tweet something, you put on Facebook something, and everything moves really quickly, which is kind of exciting. But like, in order to be able to, to kind of make some, some serious changes in the community and the society, you really need this kind of slow, intensive, time demanding, energy demanding work in the community itself, really helping people understand what's going on. And this is where we, are, where we are hitting the limits of the social media. And what I can see today, we see the two generation of, let's say, citizen activists. Once the traditional ones who, for, for, who, for whom Facebook or smartphone is like a swear word, right? They're like, oh, we're not going to use these schools. It's too cool. It's too hipster, hipster stuff. And these people have experience in working with the communities and trying to mobilize people. But they don't have the grasp on the understanding how today 
the, the communication is completely different. And then we see the new generation of activists who have good grasp uh, of the technology. They are really super smart in using it, but at the same time, they don't have this kind of experience. How how important it is, like, to be patient and to work uh, to work patiently on on some changes on the very bottom level in their communities, who are very often offline. So, thank you, thank you very much for three first opening speeches. Uh, we went for a coffee before coming here, and I already noticed that. Uh, Three of our speakers are everybody from a different environment, and, and that I am looking forward for various topics. And I see that there are three uh, little different streams, which actually have in common the media and democracy topic. So first of all, I noticed uh, I made several marks uh, for Mikolai Abchuk. Uh, I guess uh, you stressed the importance of media in development is po in post-communist uh, environment. Is in countries where they could uh, not only supply but uh, strengthen uh, the democracy and democratic framework. And uh, between the lines, I felt that uh, if there is a lack of uh, legal framework or, or lack of uh, parliamentary or political party systems uh, which is underdeveloped, that media could play important role in strengthening uh, the, cl uh, the classical or Western style of uh, democratic life. However, uh, it opens uh, new questions. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask you uh, that if we consider that media or global media, whatever, media are watchdog of democracy, who would watch the media? Actually, uh, in the framework of contemporary globalized world, for instance, Benjamin Barber uh, spoke about uh, marketing and the role of marketing and that all, are, all of us are consumed and the media don't play this role uh, of watch being a watcher of a democracy but are corrupting, corrupting all segments of society to be consumers. Secondly, uh, you spoke about uh, uh, this uh, kind of optimistic way being uh, media to add uh, some uh, strengthened democratic uh, values of society. However, again, uh, the professor of communication, for instance, in Erfurt, Kai Hafez, said that global village or network society is a myth, that nothing of it happened, that even in the globalized world, the state states have still huge control over the media. And even in here, in the last two decades, there were discussions about journalists in Ukraine vanishing, Freedom House uh, put rated down, uh, for instance, Russia in last years, uh, where the democracy is actually lacking and uh, in, the, in the mainstream media network. Uh, so I guess uh, that could be two points, uh, and maybe you have uh, some others which are my questions to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I uh, insisted on the uh, point that uh, democ uh, media uh, are uh, the most important thing in uh, democracy building because if you have free media, you can build democracy. If you have democracy but no free media, this democracy would decline and, uh, and uh, fell down. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, of course, I agree that there is very strong temptation of com commercialization and consumption. Uh, it may, might be uh, less uh, relevant for Ukraine because uh, mass media in Ukraine uh, has not become a uh, real, uh, real business. It's just uh, auxiliary. Uh, major mass media are owned by oligarchs, uh, I mean primarily TV stations, and uh, they are uh, very helpful for them to resolve their uh, personal, their private uh, issues. So uh, when I told about independent media in my country, of course it's not TV. TV is fully controlled by the government, except for one minor station which still fights tries to survive under very strong governmental pressure. TV, unfortunately, is uh, under control, and, but it is TV which is the most commercialized and most under, under threat of, of this uh, trend. Uh, but on the other hand, we still have this uh, new media, primarily internet, which is, uh, which is free and uh, which is more resistant uh, against these trends of commercialization. 
because of many reasons, actually, it's much cheaper media and uh, it's, uh, um, it's easier to maintain and easier to protect from censorship and, and, and so on. So in this, in this regard, uh, I believe that uh, we have very vibrant uh, journalism and very, very uh, good investigative journalism, which, is, which survived only in, in, in the Internet. It's impossible to publish investigative stories uh, elsewhere. Not, not to mention TV, which is, which, which, which is not lying, by the way, but uh, effectively silences all the important news which are not comfortable, convenient for, for the government. Um, so, uh, mass media, yeah, they are watchdogs, yes, but uh, your question was who, who is watching over, uh, over mass media. Well, society, I believe. Of course, there is society which uh, um, has some influence and actually, actually society is able to switch on and switch off uh, this or that uh, channel or uh, website or buy or not buy this uh, newspaper. And uh, it's, by the way, it's very, it's very, very widespread tendency um, in uh, both in Ukraine and especially in Russia and especially in Belarus that many more and more people just throw away TVs. They don't use TVs. TV becomes uh, obsolete just because it's uh, it's useless. Uh, it's uh, well, it's uh, helpful for the government. It's tool of propaganda. And uh, uh, it's very interesting sociological tendencies that less and less people, uh, especially uh, thoughtful people, uh, use uh, TV as a uh, 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 means of information. Um, so um, uh, this is my answer to one, one of, of your questions. Uh, the, other, uh, the other issue is about uh, so-called um, about deterioration of, of media environment you mentioned. Yes, it's true, and uh, Ukraine was labeled partly free with, uh, since Yanukovych came in power, so, but still it's partly free. It's not non-free like, like Russia or Belarus, uh, partly free, what, what, whatever it means to be partly free. Uh, I believe that partly free means that, of course, that uh, elections are still competitive and uh, some opposition can survive and still there are some arenas, uh, legal arenas, where society, civil society can challenge the government. Because it's impossible to challenge the government in Russia or Belarus. Simply, this, this arena, this field does not exist uh, in legal terms. In Ukraine, it's still existing, and uh, there are, I would say, there are four arenas uh, parliament, of course, electoral process, uh, judiciary, which is not independent but uh, pluralistic, so to say, and it's connected to European, uh, because Ukraine is a member of Council of Europe, so uh, even if you lose your appeals in Ukrainian courts, you may appeal. Uh, in Brussels, uh, and, and of course media. Media is the fourth and probably the most important arena where civil society can challenge, uh, challenge the government. Uh, so again, I, I'm, I'm coming back to what I stated before, that it's uh, extremely important uh, thing. And one more remark which, uh, which um, was inspired by what uh, uh, Professor Avenieri uh, mentioned here. He, very, very aptly, very properly, he mentioned this uh, failure of uh, Arab uh, revolutions uh, because of weakness of civil society. It's a very important point. Uh, it largely coincides with what I told here about this uh, connected vessels and the need to improve quality of society. You cannot, you cannot demand too much from elites if you don't have a uh, society of the same level. Um, and uh, in this regard, I would like also to, ex to, to refer to failure of Orange Revolution. It's very similar, uh, not exactly the same, because uh, I believe that in Ukraine, civil society is stronger than in uh, Egypt. Uh, but still, you know, um, still there are maybe, you know, 30% of people who are really committed to the values of Orange Revolution. Uh, all other people who supported Orange Revolution, who supported vote, and this vote bring 55 or 54 percent to Mr. Yushchenko. This vote was secured not only by uh, strongly committed people who, who really were committed to the values, but also uh, there were a lot of opportunists of different kinds, from oligarchy camp, from socialist camp, from the, and these socialists they, they provided this support and they secured victory uh, of Orange Revolution in in elections. But uh, it was very shaky coalition. It was two uh, coalition of two different people of two different political forces, and of course such a such a coalition had to, to, to fall. Uh, and
And uh, this is uh, another reminder that we have to, to carry out this so-called organic work and uh, to strengthen uh, grassroots movements to, to deal more and more with civil society. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. As our uh, discussion uh, goes on, I turn to uh, Professor Avineri. Uh, your remarks, uh, you stressed uh, importance on civic society and development and successful civic society which developed in uh, Central European countries uh, like Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary. The first question is, and I go away from Arabic word because it uh, tackles the second question, uh, why do you perceive that in some countries like in Central European core, uh, democracy and civic society could have developed in the last two decades, according to you, and some other countries, uh, as you also admitted, the civic society is strong, but the democracy has still some deficits. But the second question, I take advantage of you, that you coming from Israel and from the region, you have also mentioned. Uh, second question is related to Arab Spring. Uh, from here, it was viewed, firstly, as a one event in the original uh, initiative period of Arab Spring, and Western media created the picture of Arab Spring as a one, one event and a whole. But you have also mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood, which supplies civic society in uh, Egypt. Isn't it just that our viewed Western or Central European view of civic society is completely different because of history? We have legacy of civic society which was formed by uh, Locke, uh, by Hegel, by uh, Hobbes, and also exceptionally, the religious life played important but not, not pillar role. It was uh, by Edmund Burke and uh, by Tocqueville. But Look at Egypt and development in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood or religious uh, parties or uh, deputies gained three-fourths of seats in a parliament in Egypt. But it was uh, chosen by people. And of course, we have mentioned Samuel Huntington, and our vision of civic society is that it's actually against rising ethno-religious identities. So the second question is related to that, whether it's, it's not against democracy or is it, because it was a free election. They were not cancelled as in Algeria in 1991, their results. So, to you. Okay, this, both questions open a very wide perspective. Let me perhaps make one footnote to what Jaroslav was saying earlier. One of the issues with um, social media is the availability to large populations. And I think here, I think you, you mentioned it, uh, in Western societies, social medias uh, are more or less universal, not totally universal. In Egypt, it's probably less than 10% of the populations that have access to social media, but they are exposed to TV, which was the old state TV. Now the situation in Egypt is something which I suggest those of you are interested should watch. After the... Um, a fall of the of Mubarak, you have now a very pluralistic TV culture in Egypt, where you have private TV, you have also government TV, which is now more or less controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood, but you have a lot of uh, private TV. The question is, will the Muslim Brotherhood, which has a majority and views democracy usually in majoritarian terms, not in liberal terms, will it allow or will the following uh, months and years see that uh, will continue to be uh, access to free TV, uh, or will there be a re-monopolization of the TV seen by the government? And then again, the social media will be uh, limited to the 10%, uh, which is what um, more or less got in the elections, but it's only uh, 10%. So the issue is not just uh, uh, social media, but the availability of social media to large groups of the population, or whether it is an elite phenomenon and in Egypt and in other Arab countries, it's mainly an elite uh, phenomenon. Uh, to the uh, two questions of, uh, uh, which were asked by the chairman. Uh, the reason why uh, Central Eastern European countries were able to develop a civil society and the situation in Russia is different, 
it goes back uh, to generally history. I mean, I mentioned that uh, there were representative uh, traditions in countries like Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, and there were no representative traditions in Russia. I mean, until 1917, practically all government institutions were appointed from the central level to the local level. There was a Zemstvo attempt, but uh, uh, city councils were appointed, governors were appointed, mayors were appointed. Uh, uh, but there is also something else which I think sometimes we overlooked. When you look at the reform process uh, prior to 1989, 1990, uh, in countries like Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, and Hungary, reform started from civil society. Solidarność in Poland, uh, Carta 77, People Against Violence in Czech and uh, Slovakia, and MDF uh, in Hungary. In Russia, in the Soviet Union, reform did not start from mass movements. There were individual dissidents, and very important, but the reform started from the communist bureaucracy. It was a very typical, if I may say, historical Russian modernization or liberalization from above. And today, the liberalization wasn't, doesn't exist anymore, but the above still is. It's one thing if the uh, Communist Party liberalizes itself, because the structures either remain or are being transformed into the pyramidal structure which we see today under Putin, or whether the people who come to power are dissidents. In Russia, no prime minister, no uh, president is a former dissident. They are reformed bureaucrats at best. KGB. Or, or KGB. <laughs> well, KGB sometimes a reforming, uh, reforming uh, you know, sometimes the KGB people who, because they know something about the West, are more open-minded than the uh, local secretary from uh, Krasnoyarsk, because he doesn't know anything. The KGB person was in the West, so he knows something. So, I mean, but again, it is a pyramidal hierarchical structure. So this explains a little bit the fact that when you have Lech Wawensa as president, Havel as president, it's something different if you have uh, Gorbachev, an apparatchik, a good apparatchik, okay? An apparatchik as president, or you have Yeltsin, another apparatchik, a little problematic apparatchik, and now you have Putin, certainly an apparatchik as president. And this is not just personal, it has to do with the structures in power. So this gives a little bit of an answer. Uh, about the, the question you asked about the Middle East, I think it would be, uh, again, uh, I'm, I'm not a Huntingtonian. I think Huntington is very much, it's wrong in a lot of things. And I think we should also be very careful not to characterize Muslim societies as being religious. Most people in Muslim countries are not religious. They are traditional, they are conventional, but they're not religious in a deep sense. I think a Polish society under Solidarność was much more religious in a Catholic way than many people in Egypt are religious. But when you have the absence of civil society, when the groups that do work at the social level are religiously oriented, then they have not a monopoly of power, but they have an advantage. When you look at Egypt today, the people who vote and we don't have enough information, but some information is available. When you ask people, uh, why did you vote for, uh, for the Muslim Brotherhood? The answer is not necessarily in religious terms. They don't say because those are religious people and they go in the way of the prophet and I believe in the prophet, etc. They give the answer because they have kindergartens, they reach out us to us, they, in the mosque, they help us when we need and this also gives uh, those organizations an extreme advantage. When you see today demonstrations in Egypt, many of them, when you, when you can look, there are bearded people, not many uh, women. You, you see a different uh, population demonstrating now in support of the government. Most of them were, went, are going now to Tahrir because they have been, had meetings in the mosque and in a very old fashioned way with a microphone or without a microphone, somebody tells them, now we go to a demonstration. They don't, they don't even use TV. Never mind, uh, never mind uh, smartphones or anything like this. So the old fashioned way in a society which is basically pre-modern, very basically traditional helps. And one final comment, which perhaps makes a 
focuses on the difference. In the protest movement, the, the uh, dissenting movement in Central and Eastern Europe, also in Russia, but certainly in Central and Eastern Europe, the West, America, was a model. People wanted to be free as they are in the West. As they are, let's say, in, not only in America, but basically. The West in the Arab Muslim society is not the model. The West in Arab Muslim society is in many cases the enemy because they brought imperialism, colonialism, they brought uh, uh, secularization, uh, which is considered to be a Western uh, model. They are also helping Israel, this adds to the problem, but basically the West, America, is a devil because the West is a devil. And therefore, here, if you wanted to be like America, you don't always, you can't be like America and one shouldn't be like America. America is a society with a lot of problems. But as a model, a Western, secular, pluralistic society, uh, when you look into the language which is used uh, in, uh, especially in Egypt, but also in Syria, uh, the term is not as, secularism is used, well, the word secularism in Arabic means something like godless pagan. So the term which is being used is a civil state, not a secular state. So when you say civility, civility is a very uh, generalized term because secularism is something which was imported by the sword, by the power of the West. So the West is certainly not a model and therefore if it's not a model, you look into your own society. And one of the, this has been said by an American a sociologist of Lebanese background, Fuad Adjami, who said, in the Arab world, in the last hundred years, because of the crisis of modernization, every model was imported from the West. Liberal democracy, parliamentary democracy, French republicanism, British parliamentary, fascism, Nazism, communism, modern nationalism, all those things were imported and had, uh, sometimes were in power. Uh, all of them have failed. And now when all those important models have failed, you go back to your sources, you go back to the authenticity, you can say, well, the prophet has said and we would like to live like the prophet. It has now legitimacy because all the models imported from the West, which originally had a legitimacy amongst the elite, but were basically bankrupted and were failing. So you have a great advantage for what is considered to be authentic or the invention or reinvention of the uh, authentic Islamic uh, Republic or country. So the situation with all the parallels is in many fundamental issues different and the same has to do with, uh, with the press. The idea that the free press is a vehicle for democracy, the free press in some of the discourse you, some of the discourse you have in the, mid, in the Middle East is that the free press is a recipe for chaos for cars, for everybody, irresponsible, can make the views and you need somebody who will tell you what is true and what is not true. This also happens sometimes, I think, in Russia, and certainly in Uzbekistan and uh, in the Central Asian Republics, but certainly it happens in the Middle East. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Analyz uh, Ryabchuk, a little bit. Just, just a minor footnote to uh, what uh, Professor Abinieri uh, just told. Uh, I, I just want to draw attention uh, that um, uh, the uh, process of uh, um, dismantling of communism uh, depended not only on uh, str strength of civil society. Of course, it was uh, of paramount importance, and there was big difference between uh, Poland, uh, say, and, and Russia. Uh, but also, uh, we should remember that all these movements, uh, including Polish, including Czech or Slovak, were, they were not only civic movements, they were also national liberation movement. And uh, this was, 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 it was a kind of symbiosis, very, uh, very complicated synergy of two different trends, uh, civic and uh, nationalistic, or le let's say national liberation movement. And after the fall of communism, we uh, witnessed very uneasy uh, co coexistence of these two different trends. In many cases, they diverged. We see this in Poland, actually. Uh, so this is only one thing I'd like to, to remind you. And of course, in Russia, it virtually did not exist. There was no national liberation. Uh, the same problem was in Romania and Bulgaria, in countries where communism was internalized nationalized. There also was very weak, uh, there 
was very weak need for national liberation because they virtually had some sort of uh, national communism there. That's my main difference. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, before I turn to uh, the audience and collect uh, your questions, you prepare yourself now, uh, I would still have uh, questions uh, to Jaroslav Valuch uh, from Človek v tísni. Uh, from your point of view, you spoke, uh, allow me to say, not as much about citizens like about netizens. You know, who people who are like uh, uh, Nielsen Weirer, uh, call them uh, Generation C, like people who are connective, uh, who, who, have, who, has, who was connected on the web, who are on, and uh, who also create uh, users created content, the web is their home. Actually, this division was created uh, in the framework of uh, Web 2.0. There were just digital natives, that's you, your generation, and there are digital um, immigrants, that's we. Like uh, You were born with your mobile phone, and um, we were born, and we remember the world without internet. So we are migrating into your space, not uh, you to our space. However, uh, the research in 2009 uh, conducted uh, says that there there is a uh, null block generation or nil block generation. And according to that research, not very people are really uh, creating users, cre users and creators uh, that all are passive. And this uh, research just revealed that young generation is on the net looking at YouTube, looking at Facebook, and chatting, but the same, same amount of time as their parents are focused on meeting friends, playing basketball, watching TV, etc. And then just one, two, three persons of them create blogs, create Wikipedia, etc. So the first question is related to that, whether it's not exaggerated, the issue of uh, netizens. And secondly, uh, because you pointed also importance of uh, uh, netizens in revolutionary uh, movements and emancipation. According to me, and now maybe I am siding with uh, Professor Avineri in uh, Iran uh, when Musavi was not elected and some young people wished uh, Musavi had been elected. They had to go to the streets anyway. They could try to, to call themselves for uh, main Square in Tehran uh, via Twitter or via Facebook whatsoever, but Ahmadinejad counted his supporters and his opponents on the streets, as well as Tahir Square, who people were connected via Twitter, via Facebook whatsoever, but it was most important when they really showed up on the streets and stayed for a weeks or month to wait for changes. Whether, whether it's really not uh, the stress on a net uh, is, is not uh, too much uh, exaggerated. So in two, one general question about null block generation, what do you think about it? And the second question about the uh, real issues, whether revolutionaries could stay on the net or they need to go to the streets. Uh, and then it will be on you. Okay, yeah, we have so many topics in this, in this so I hope I will not forget uh, all my thoughts that I have on this. I'll uh, remember you. Yeah, well, mentioning uh, research in this field that comes from 2009 is like ancient history, right? I mean, this field is like developing so rapidly. But I mean, I, I completely understand what you mean, and we are in that situation. Also, when you were mentioning citizens and netizens, we can also talk about activism, but also about clicktivism and about selectivism, right? This is something that's called the lazy activism, that for people today, that actually there's a threat that the social media and the connectivity is turning people who normally could be activists or active is turning them into lazy activists because it's like super easy to click like on, on some calls on Facebook and like feel like, okay, I've done enough. I mean, I don't need to go to the street or I don't need to participate in some community kind of efforts and stuff like that. So there's discussion around this. And I mean, there's still no like statistical data on this, like what is actually happening. I mean, this is still a very new field and, and dynamically changing. Uh, but what I, wanna, uh, what I want to say, uh, like in Egypt, and it was kind of a joke, but it, actually it was kind of a reality, was that the worst thing that Mubarak uh, could do during, during the uprising was to shut down the internet, right? 
because the young people, the young generation, you know, who is used to use Facebook to communicate with friends, I mean, they started using these tools uh, like to share the information about what is happening. But they were sitting at home, right, like chatting and being online and looking at stuff. And if you shut down the internet, well, what the young people could do? I mean, they just go out, and that's when you get in trouble, right, because you have the young people on the streets, and this is... So, like, probably this was one of the reasons why when the internet blackout didn't, you know, last more than a couple of days, because people were finding alternative ways how to get information out, right? Uh, people still had uh, mobile phones, so they were using mobile phones to, to communicate with the world, right, getting the message out. When the mobile network was shut down, uh, you still have satellite phones. It's m m mostly used by activists in Syria now to get the get the get the messages out. But also, when the mobile network was shut down, I mean, people were using landlines, and Google and Twitter c created a service called Call to Tweet, where you could call from your landline international number. It was recorded, and the volunteers were using it and keep tweeting it and translating it into English. So there was, there are always some ways how to get get the information out. It's going to be also more and more difficult for the governments to to do these complete shutdowns of internet for for a couple of reasons. One of them is the governments itself and the business sector is more and more dependent in the countries on the internet. And if you shut down the entire internet, you are not only crippling the opposition, but you are also crippling kind of your structures and your yourself. Uh, the second reason, as I said, is just people will always find a way how to get, get the message out. And the third reason is that people are getting used to internet as a, as a source of information and, and, and entertainment. It's becoming a natural part of our lives, not only in, let's say, the Western world, but also in the, in the, in the MENA region, like the Middle East and North Africa, where people simply like to share information on Facebook, they like to watch the videos with funny little kittens playing piano, following funny kids. And if you take this from them, that's when kind of this, this majority of people, like who are not necessarily the activists who would be willing to, you know, get killed or get beaten on the streets, this is when they get upset, right? Because you are taking something away from them that they like. And that's when they get upset about their governments, right? And this was uh, to some extent also the, the reason for the success in Tunisia, when the people were getting angry that simply, I mean, that the government is taking away from them like stuff that they like. And yes, the, if we look at the research, I mean, mostly what young people do, or not only young people do on the internet, they are using it for entertainment and fun. Also to find information, that's, that's, that's also, mm, that's also uh, part of the activities that people do there. But yes, but it's nothing new. I mean, even in pre-social media society, I mean, you had only certain percentage of people in the, co uh, in the society who were active, who were willing to kind of uh, sacrifice maybe their comfort, maybe their lives to do something, or simply to, uh, you know, to have more difficult life in their community. I remember, you know, starting as environmental activist, I mean, back in my hometown, I mean, you felt a little bit like an idiot, right? Because for people around you, it was like, well, this is weird, like that somebody's doing something just voluntarily and wants to change stuff. So, I mean, it's, there are always only certain percentage of people who are willing to take action and do something. And this exactly transformed into the online world. I mean, there are still, Again, just part of the people are active and are actively using it. And like based on some research of like, okay, are social media having some social impact in the offline world? Uh, the results are saying that social media are great for raising awareness about stuff, right? So people can learn about what is, what is happening. And that's more or less it. But at the same time, social media are incredibly useful tool for people who are active. That means like for activists, for, for, uh, for civic organizers, politicians, and also journalists, right? So it, it gives to the people who are active like incredibly useful tool that they can use to get the message out and to mobilize people. And uh, yeah, well, we can keep, you know, complaining about young generation or they just, you know, want to play, they want to have fun. I mean, that's, this is not, this is not going to get us anywhere, right? And I think that the answer to, to many of the challenges that we are facing, uh, uh, facing in, the, in the world of internet and people more and more connected and the question, you know, how can we trust the information that comes from the internet is something that, that we call the digital literacy, right? So you have literacy, the ability to read and write, and you have media literacy, that means like, ability to read and write media, right? To deconstruct media and also to produce media. And digital literacy is simply the ability to read and write in the digital world. What it means, I mean, it means to be able to extract relevant information from the vast, you know, vast amount of information on the internet. How you search for content, how you set up your filters. That means like 
how you filter the information from the internet that is only relevant and maybe trusted and verified. So this is one of the skills. The second skill is, uh, skill is like how do you create content? So how do you create content that is attractive, that will attract attention of people? You have to, because today you really have to fight with those little funny kittens, right? Because they, they are the ones who are stealing the attention of people. So you need to be able to, to produce content, and I'm speaking about activists, content that will attract people's attention and will, de will deliver the message in some uh, interesting and attractive way. Then it's about the ability to share the content. And not only to share the content, but to share it effectively, but also share it responsibly and in a secure way. I mean, I've seen and I've witnessed so many cases when the activists, the online activists, got into serious troubles, particularly in the countries with the repressive regimes, just because they were acting unresponsibly and insecurely on the internet, right? And we don't have to talk about like digit, uh, about hack, hackers and uh, super sophisticated uh, technologies. It's simply about like people don't realize that if they put something on Twitter and they put something on Facebook, they can quickly get in trouble, right? Because those are great tools for the uh, intelligent services, right? And uh, yeah, and also and, and the, the, the fourth skills of digital literacy is also like how you can use these tools uh, to organize people who are uh, towards some goal, right? Like if you are upset about something in your community, so how can you uh, mobilize people to do something about it? How can you Too use many. these tools? Yeah, well, no, that's that's more or less, uh, that's Maximum. More or less it. Uh, just uh, last point, I mean, if you are talking about the role of social media in democracy or in, in society, I mean, we can split it into two, two different categories. Like One is like free open democracies and then the repressive regimes. And I can see the different role of social media in these, in, in these two contexts. Uh, that's why also probably why the revolutions were called the Facebook revolution, because in countries where the media are not free, are, are completely under the control, the people are pushed to seek alternative ways of communication, alternative ways of expression. That's why the internet and the social media became like this kind of alternative space where people actually could learn about information. You know, that's why, why blogging is so, uh, so, so popular in so many countries. And uh, in the societies, maybe a Czech society, I mean, where we have free independent media, and now we can have, you know, ongoing discussion about it if we have independent media or not. But still, I mean, the media are, uh, are free and we have access to the media. So we were not pushed to seek alternative ways. And the role of social media in, in democracy should be more uh, pushing the responsible uh, authorities and the governments for more accountability and for more transparency. So kind of play the watchdog roles. In the old days, it was the media or the journalists who were called the watchdogs of democracy. Today, with these tools we have, it can be also the citizens who are playing the role of watchdogs. And as I said, pushing, pushing those responsible for, the, uh, for management of public, uh, of, of public affairs to be more accountable and to be more transparent. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, it's on you. So I just uh, appreciate you came and uh, listened until now. And now I expect, or we all expect, your questions to our guests. So go on. Try to be active generation on public. We are citizens now, not netizens. Now we are off. <laughs> yeah. You would like to read questions? No. <laughs> okay, so Dean. Answers up here. Um, let me uh, draw your or our attention uh, towards the uh, future. I don't mean the next century, but uh, the near future. Um, we have uh, three different geographical as well as cultural and political spheres here. Uh, the Eastern Central Europe, Eastern Europe and the Near East. Uh, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you uh, to present your ideas, opinions uh, concerning uh, the development, uh, the civic society development uh, in these spheres in uh, the next, say, five, ten years? I mean, the, the main uh, trends. Thank you. The question to whom? To we have three spheres, so we have to take three different mm -hmm. Okay. So it was uh, no question or? It's one to one. One to one. Okay, so start. 
Uh, well, I, I, I feel that we don't really represent the regions you mentioned because both uh, Israel and Ukraine are countries in between. They are very, they, they don't really belong to the region where they are located. Uh, Ukraine is a country which uh, is half, uh, well, half of the country was in the Russian sphere of influence and the other half uh, actually had, had never been there. It was uh, Polish and eventually uh, Habsburgian part of the country. So it's, it also complicates the entire story. And this makes the country so ambiguous and uh, reluctant uh, in moving in other, either direction. So my prediction is that um, within the next uh, 10, 20 years, uh, all, all the countries of my region, so-called Eastern or New Eastern Europe, would still fluctuate between this uh, unconsolidated democracy and unconsolidated authoritarianism, still would be uh, at the crossroads. Um, but ultimately, I, I believe that not only Ukraine, but also Belarus and, and, uh, and Moldova and all other new East European countries would uh, move into the right direction. They would join uh, European Union and uh, Europe in general. Uh, European crisis would be overcome by that time, so it's very good, very convenient uh, timetable. Um, as, to, uh, as to the global uh, developments, uh, I am rather pessimistic because I believe that the entire, our entire civilization is moving in the wrong direction because of this overconsumption and uh, uh, exhaustion of resources and uh, just uh, irresponsible behavior of the majority of global population. Thank you. Uh, Professor Avinari, your two to three minutes. Um, I think I'll agree about Central and Eastern Europe. Let me say something about the Middle East. Um, first of all, I do not know. I do not know where the Middle East is going. Uh, there are 23 Arab countries. And the, what's called the Arab Awakening, which I think is a better term, it's also an Arab term with deep hist history in the Arab literature. The Arab Awakening or the Arab Spring um, toppled dictatorships in Tunis, in Egypt, in a very complicated way in Yemen, and that's it. Uh, a, war, a dictatorship was uh, toppled by the Americans in Iraq, and the situation in Syria is still fluid. What one has to understand is that in most Arab countries there were no revolutions in the last year and a half. And the interesting divide among countries that did have revolution and successful revolution and those that didn't is the following. All those regimes which were brought down or are challenged, as in Syria, were Republican regimes, which were really Republican military dictatorships. In all of those countries, the, uh, the presidents were former generals who took off their uniform, put on uh, Western suits, and became Republican presidents. And they lacked legitimacy. Whereas if you look at the countries where until now there have been no serious protest movement, they are some of the traditional dynasties. Morocco, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, all the Gulf uh, Emirates with one exception, Bahrain. And in Bahrain there was, there was a de demonstration which was brought down and in Bahrain you have a majority Shia population with a Sunni dynasty, so it became a Sunni Shia divide. And one of the reasons why, until now, you didn't have meaningful uh, protest movements or revolution in those dynastic countries is that they are somehow connected with traditional legitimacy. In Morocco and Jordan, the kings, the both, both kings, are considered descendants of the prophet. And to uh, demonstrate against the descendant of the prophet, you cannot just call him a thief or a dictator you are demonstrating against the prophet. In, in, in very traditional society, in Saudi Arabia, uh, the dynasty, which is, has a complicated history, but is a defender of the two holy uh, sites of uh, Islam, Mecca and Medina. So there is a sort of, it also helps that it's very rich. I mean, when you have money, it really helps. Uh, and the same is, of course, in Kuwait and other countries. So uh, it will be interesting to see, as I said, I do not know whether the movement which started with demonstrations against a Republican dictatorship with, with very little legitimacy, whether it will spread to the kingdoms and the more traditional ones. If it will happen, this will perhaps have much more an impact than the recent revolutions because the dynastic traditional loyalties 
uh, are also oil-rich. So it will have an impact beyond politics. It will impact about relations with the West, about the price of oil, etc. So as I said, I do not know, but this is where I would look for to see where the, the key developments uh, would be. Uh, one final and short comment. One of the consequences of bringing down dictatorships or democratization movement is that it can also bring about splitting up of countries. In Central Eastern Europe, the 1989 developments brought up the splitting of the Soviet Union into 15 countries, Yugoslavia in a very bloody way, and Czechoslovakia in a more or less velvet way, but also there was a split. Something similar may be happening in the Middle East, and some of it is already happening. In Iraq, the bringing down of the Hussein, uh, Saddam Hussein dictatorship created an opportunity in the window for a Kurdish de facto autonomy on de facto state, really. Uh, in Sudan, we have seen something similar, South Sudan. Uh, in Libya, the bringing down of a dictator also brought up very local forces because in the Middle East, and this one has to remember, most of the, of the frontiers, of the boundaries, uh, are not historical boundaries. Egypt is an historical entity going down thousands of years. But countries like Libya or Syria or Iraq were set up by the British and the French imperialists after 1918, and they drew lines in the sand. And those countries do not have any historical identity. So uh, in many cases, the only way to hold them together, and this is what Assad says, and he is in a way right, the only way of holding Syria together is by an iron fist. Because if you democratize Syria, then the Kurds would like to go in one direction, the Alawites would like to maintain the small mountains, the Christians will have perhaps to look to Lebanon. So the developments of the Arab awakening may also uh, create the splitting or the uh, deconstruction or even destruction of existing countries. Thank you. Uh, Jaroslav Valuch, I ask you for two, three minutes maximum because yeah, yeah. Please I'll stop, please please stop thank me you. if I, I just will. keep going. Yeah. Uh, yeah, from my perspective on the, on the media and the future of the media and social media, I really don't like the division, division between like old media and new media, right? This notion that, I mean, there are old media that are dying and there are new media that are coming to replace them. I mean, we don't see that. What we see and we will see more and more is some kind of convergence or convergence between those two, right? Because we can see that the traditional media are adapting, of course, to the new situation where people simply like more to consume uh, information from the internet and from their friends, from their networks. And also uh, the, the, the new technologies and the social media and, and uh, uh, are more like looking also back onto the traditional journalism practices, like how to deal with the situation, how can we verify content, right? So, so, so we will see this uh, converg uh, convergence. What also is important to realize is that, okay, statistically, Internet is now beating television as a number one source of information, right? So it's like, ooh, Internet's winning and television, is, the old television is dying. But if you look at like where people find, look for information on the Internet, they're actually turning into the kind of old, uh, well, yes, I don't like old, the traditional, you know, professional media sources, right? Also, statistically, if you look, uh, look on what people share most on Twitter, they are mostly referring to the kind of traditional media sources, right? Online, okay, they're online, uh, online versions, but still people are kind of referring to them. If you want to get your message, message across uh, on the social media, if you really want to kind of uh, address uh, important part of the population, you still need the traditional media to pick it up as a story and broadcast it to the masses, right? So again, if you want to get some serious attention, you need the traditional media and the mass media. So this is what we're gonna see, we will see the convergence. And there was a notion also, globally speaking, about something that's called the digital gap. There was expectations that the digital gap will go across the geographical, uh, geographical uh, lines, that there's gonna be this digitally kind of high-tech west, north, and then there's gonna be the poor Africa with hungry children and no access to internet. But what we see actually, the most exciting innovations these days are not coming from Silicon Valley, but they're coming from Africa, from centers like Nairobi in Kenya, where like people, and also not only the, the, the elites, but also the general population is completely skipping the phase when people were connecting to the internet through computer and they're connecting to the internet through mobile phones, because the, the prices of connection and prices of phones are so dropping down that we see like really increase and in distribution of these technologies into also like the 
kind of socially uh, uh, more low positioned uh, groups of the society. So probably we will see also more uh, of this. So, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, so our time is uh, coming to run out. So I really would appreciate uh, if some of you have another question or one of the last questions. I don't want to call you not just null block generation, but also null public space generation. So come on, raise some question right now if you want. <laughs> I want to scare you. So you can ask in check. So. A mám takové dva příklady, které se zdají být rozdílné, ale potom, potom k ním směřuje jedna otázka. V roce 2010 jsem byl součástí konference podádané Mubarakovou rodinou v Egyptě na Cruise 2010, kam byli pozváni studenti z celého světa. Asi 200 z toho, tedy 160, bylo z afrických zemí. A konference se zdála velmi perfektní, nezjistil jsem tedy důvod, k čemu sloužila předtím. Byli jsme pozváni na loď, kde jsme jeli asi 12 dní nebo 15 a celou dobu byl jediný účel to navštěvovat památky a později tedy vlastně večer mít nějaký program kulturní, o který se starali studenti z každé země, kde ji představovali. Na závěr konference jsme byli pozváni na večerní ceremonii do Luxoru kde před štáby 20 zemí světa jsme měli prohlásit nějakou přečíst větu, kterou jsme měli přeložit, že bojujeme proti demokracii, násilí a podobně. Bylo to tři měsíce před arabským jarem, upozorňuji. A takže to, bylo vlastně, to byl cíl té konference, že ty studenti, kteří tam měli s tím, že tedy budou konferovat, tak si užijí Egypt. A Your question, please. na závěr tohle. A druhý příklad, druhý příklad je to, že vlastně takovýhle lobismus, který tomu dneska říkáme lobismus tady v Čechách, tak to samé vidí v médiích tady, kde třeba velmi propagují, ať už jsou to medicamenty nebo různé finanční produkty a tak dále. A jsou většinou koupené, zase placené nějakými Můžete médií. Můžete otázku? Otázka je, jaký je tedy rozdíl mezi těmito dvěma příklady, ač odlišnými, ale ten lobismus vidím na obou stranách. <laughs> Professor Avinari, my I'm answer. going to say again, I do not know, but this time I really do not know uh, what the difference is. I, I think it was pretty obvious what, uh, why you were there. This is, uh, this, uh, your d description sort of reminded me of last uh, sort of Komsomol uh, world use uh, peace uh, conferences. Uh, and of, of, I don't think there's much of a difference between this political propaganda and business lobbying. The only difference, I mean, the media are the same more or less. You give, they give you a good time. Uh, the aims are different. Here it is to create uh, support for regime and then for business. One of the things which perhaps in this case was evident, and you were there, I wasn't, is that the regime in Egypt in the last few years was so intertwined with business, especially business uh, connected with one of the sons of, uh, of Mubarak, Gamal Mubarak, I don't know whether he was at your conference or not, So the line between political propaganda and business involvement uh, was a little blurred, and I don't think it helped the business. It certainly didn't help uh, the government. It created the sort of uh, uh, plutocratic uh, atmosphere uh, around the regime in Egypt. Thank you. Shortly, uh, some of uh, anybody of you want to say something? So very shortly, please. Yes, <laughs> so Yaroslav, you please. know, for me again, I mean, yeah, it's propaganda is manipulation. I mean, the methods are, are the same, regardless if you promote some ideas, political ideas, if you want to sell a washing powder, right? I mean, the, the methods, the technology is the same. So for me, again, the answer is like literate society that is able to, you know, see the manipulation and see why people are trying to, to influence your mind through these methodologies, right? So we really be able to deconstruct the message, who produced the message, why, what was the purpose, how they trying to attract your attention, how they use music, how they use emotions to really kind of, you know, uh, play on your emotions and try to kind of manipulate you towards a certain behavior. So it's really about like not banning everything and censoring everything, but simply being able naturally to be critical on like these type of messages that are being delivered to you through media or social media. Thank you very much. So last question. 
from the audience. I'm waiting. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, there was a uh, please short question. If you can address your, you were the second, so I'm yeah. sorry. It's the last, maybe afterwards, but I am pressed by time also. <laughs> uh, good morning. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this conference. I'm very sorry uh, for coming so late. Uh, my question is about media and the so-called commercial censorship, which means a censorship because of uh, copyright, or because of uh, protection of some uh, uh, commercial activities, etc., etc. We know about the Great Firewall of China, but there is also a Great Firewall of the United States in which YouTube videos can be blocked because of DMCA complaints, etc., uh, etc. Et and sometimes it can uh, it can uh, uh, prevent. Uh, uh, human rights message uh, from getting out. Uh, so, I would like to uh, ask you a question about the commercial censorship, uh, about its future, and uh, what can we do about it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mikola Ryabchuk, please, your minute uh, answer. Well, I, I agree. It's a, it's a serious problem, but uh, not, uh, not of paramount importance. Uh, we, uh, we don't experience this problem because uh, we can use a lot of uh, Russian pirated uh, films and music. It's available. Uh, I feel that some, some protection of this kind, uh, kind should exist, at least for the uh, living authors. But uh, basically, I disagree with uh, uh, copyright uh, opening for, uh, for children and grandchildren. I believe it should, all these copyrights, uh, copyrights should uh, be exhausted with the death of the owner. That's, that's all. After his death, it should be common property. That's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, Professor Avineri? Uh, I agree. I mean, co co copyright by its very definition is a limitation of free speech. You should be aware. It is becoming more of an issue because now of the different media. So the issue of copyright is theoretically an issue that has to be confronted. I agree that it should be really lim limited to the, to the life of the author. Authors have some sort of uh, uh, right in what they have created, but it shouldn't be perpetuated. Uh, and there are some dilemmas here, but they go back to the very issue of copyright, which perhaps should be uh, uh, reopened. Uh, until recently, the copyright issue was a sort of settled because the Berne Convention, etc. It probably is a theoretical issue to be discussed. Thank you. And uh, Jaroslav Aluch? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I agree on what, was, uh, what has been said, but I want to bring into attention another type of censorship that's going to probably shape our future. I mean, the more we... Uh, the more we consume information on the social media, the more we live in the online world, the more uh, we are... Mm, there's something that I would call the comfort censorship. That means like that we are being closed in our bubbles, in our bubbles on social networks, our friends. We are getting messages through our friends, but I mean who might have the similar kind of bias and, and opinions as we, as we do. At the same time, if I am going to Google uh, search some information on Google, the results will be different than, than yours, than yours, than yours. It's not because somebody would be censoring it on purpose, but it's simply the algorithm and the technology that is trying to make it easier for you. And I think this is going to be the danger that we need to address somehow, I don't know how, in the future, that simply we individually will be living more and more in closed bubbles, closed in some kind of opinion fields, and will be more and more kind of preventing on getting information from, from, from other, other sources. So I think this, this could be a challenge. Echo room, echo room. Okay, uh, thank you very much to all of you participants who came. Uh, František would ask afterwards, I guess, and uh, for some others uh, also. Uh, so I'd like to also thank our guests who came here, namely to political research and analyst Mikola Ryabchuk from Kiev. Professor of Political Science in Hebrew University, in, from Hebrew University in Israel, uh, Shlomo Avineri. <laughs> and from Člověk v tísni, Jaroslav Valuch. Thank you very much and have a nice day.